Good afternoon. We're going to wait just a minute or so uh, so our colleagues at Redwood City are all logged on, logged on and ready to go. But thank you all for being here. Those chimes work well, don't they? <laughs> We ready? Okay, great. Well, good afternoon. Welcome. It's a delight to be here in Berg Hall with all of you. And also, we're streaming this live to the Cardinal Conference Hall at our Redwood City location. We opened the beautiful facilities at Redwood City this summer. I hope that uh, all of you in this room will have at some point a chance to visit those facilities. It's really a wonderful campus. And we're delighted that we have so many of our School of Medicine uh, employees working there every day. It's such an exciting time. It's the beginning of an academic year, but I feel like already there's been so much occur. Just a couple of weeks ago, we dedicated the new Stanford Hospital. And that, of course, will be opening for patients on November 17th. And also coming up later this week and also later in the month, we'll be doing the dedication ceremonies for the fifth floor of the Lucille Packard Children's Hospital. More about those exciting events in the panel discussion that's coming up. But I just wanted to say in these brief introductory remarks that everything we do here at Stanford Medicine is because of you, because of the amazing people that devote their life and their energy to our institution every day. And this town hall meeting, this state of Stanford Medicine meeting, gives us an opportunity and leadership to express our appreciation to all of you. We are here because of you, and we are what we are because of you. We're also going to have a chance in the hour that's coming up to hear about some of those uniquely Stanford things that make this such an exciting place to be through the panel discussion that will follow uh, the discussion with Paul, David, and me. Thank you again for being here. We hope this is an engaging and informative hour. As always, please give us your feedback. And now I'd like to invite David and Paul, along with our moderator, Dr. Andrew Bloomcollins, Chair of the Department of Emergency Medicine, to come to the stage for our panel discussion. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Lloyd. Uh, it's been about a year uh, since I celebrated becoming part of the Stanford community, and I feel very honored to be here uh, to usher in the Precision Health Revolution. So we're all very excited to see our new hospital in action, and while we have to wait just a while longer uh, to see that happen, we're going to be showing a short video to, see, to show you what makes our new hospital such a unique patient care environment. The new Stanford Hospital marks a milestone in our leadership in precision health. A place to deliver a healthcare experience that is uniquely Stanford. Where we will apply leading edge technologies and translate groundbreaking discoveries for our patients. We have reinvented our approach to care delivery for the digital world. Technology for better decision making technology for closer collaboration, and technology for the next generation of patient-centered care. Thousands of people working together to deliver the best possible care in the best possible environment. Welcome to the new Stanford Hospital. Gives you goof up. Well, we'll start with David. Uh, in the past month, we've had a number of events to celebrate the new Stanford Hospital. Can you tell us a little bit more, more about that? Absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you all for coming. It's great to see you all here. Let me have by a show of hands, who got an opportunity to go through either a tour or th some of our opening events, community days? Oh, fantastic, great response. What did you think? Was that not amazing? Let me tell you a little bit about, because we wanted to make sure that with the opening of the new hospital, 
that we created a bit of an event out of it. And so I loved being in there, and you would get people that were kind of wandering around. They were looking, whether it was at the building, the room, the art, the atrium, and there were the oohs and ahs. And then I'd go up and ask people, what do you think? And the universal data-driven random sampling response was, wow. <laughs> I thought, there's not much more you can say to that. It was kind of neat to see that. We anticipated, by the way, about four to 5,000 people would come through. We had over 17,000 that actually came through the building. And so the community response, the ability to be able to showcase something that one, they had been seen constructed for the last decade, but something that they felt important about was really neat to see them respond to. Now, there's a couple more things that we have that are coming up. One will have the official ribbon cutting on October 23rd, and then we will officially move into the building on October 17th. And so we're very excited. Uh, it's a Sunday morning. Going to be a lot of activity. One of the things I was particularly excited about, it takes us six hours to get everybody moved over. That's incredible. You think about the transition planning that's occurred on this has been the last couple of years, and Andre's going to give me the hook because I'm going to keep going on and on about this really cool building, but there's a lot of amazing things that will go on. We'll actually begin service in the ER on that same Sunday morning, as well as not elective cases for those surgeons that are in the room, but for emergency cases. We'll start those on the Monday, but a lot of great things. What I'm excited about is the people that had the opportunity to be in the building, they saw what it could do. It literally is the most technologically sophisticated hospital in the world. When it opened, there would be more technology to be able to enable the care experience both between the provider and the patient, but also what the patient sees in the bed and in the room. So we're so excited, and what a great culmination of a lot of great activity that came to this fruition. So this is the fourth hospital that you've helped open and lead. Um, in your experience, how has that impacted patients and the patient care teams? Well, I can say the fourth hospital that I've been involved with, but there's nothing like this one. I mean, this truly differentiates anything that uh, I've been involved with before, and so it's so exciting to see this. What will be different for our patients? Because I think part of that most technologically sophisticated hospital is what are we going to bring to them? Some of the exciting things that you'll see in the patient room, for those of you, and there was a great a number of hands that went up on those individuals that actually saw the rooms, the engagement in the room, the ability to be able to have the patient part of that care experience will be undifferentiated around the country and what we do. The ability to literally be able to have on the screen your test results, have interactions with your physician, the ability to be able to actually um, control the blinds, order room service, all the things that are important to that stay are right there in the room. Uh, the fact that we have wall-to-wall -wall windows to create the light and experience in great views. I did say during the opening events, I'm a little worried our length of stay is gonna go up and we're gonna be able to get patients out of the hospital. So that's an important aspect of this as well. I also like the fact that if you look at our current emergency department, and we may have somebody on the stage who's particularly attuned to that, it was completely, uh, is now completely undersized. And so to be able to go from a facility that we're in currently with the expansion that will accommodate about 42,000 patients, we're going to hit about 80,000 patients in the space this year, to be able to go to the space that we have now and be able to create the privacy for our patients. That is critical. I've taken a couple donors through uh, the emergency department, and it's interesting because you show them the actual the doors on what will be the treatment rooms, and they're like, what are these? There's no curtain. There's no, uh, there's ability to actually have a private conversation. You even look at the technology in the room that allows you to be able to bring in real-time interpreter services if you need that or e-consults, so there's a lot of exciting things that come about that. But how do we create the kind of environment that embodies the greatness, I think, of the, the faculty here and what we are able to provide, and the facility will only augment that and make that even more uh, exciting for our patients. Thank you. Paul, 
You became president and CEO of Stanford Children's Health just seven short months ago. Even though a lot of things have happened, how has the adjustment been and what are the things that you've learned? Oh, my thanks. Thanks. First of all, I joined David in welcoming all of you to this room. It's, believe me, it looks a lot different up here than it looks from all of you out there in the room. It's quite impressive to see how many of you showed up and shout out to our friends there in Redwood City. Uh, while well, we're talking about Redwood City, I'm your neighbor. I actually settled in uh, Emerald Hills. That's where I, I was able to find a home there. So just a short 15 minute drive over uh, from home. So that part of my settling has gone quite well. Uh, at uh, Stanford Children's Health, Lucille Packard Children's Hospital, Stanford, we're also a, a place where we deliver babies. So I've been here, uh, not quite the full term of a fetus. Uh, oh, that's uh, when, I, when I think of it that way. Uh, nice. and, and so when you think of it that way, you know, a little fetus is growing and you're learning a lot. So I'm uh, learning quite a bit about uh, how the Stanford environment sort of works together, usually most of the time, and, and also sometimes how it doesn't. So I think all of those are, are interesting learnings for me. Uh, I think some of the significant things that I've learned over the past seven, eight months is really how uh, really impressive this community is and how welcoming this community is. I've felt very warmly welcomed by everyone that I've come into contact with. And just the ability to leverage all that is Stanford. I think when we think about Stanford Medicine being part of the infrastructure of Stanford University and all of the projects we're able to work with across all of the different schools, I think that's also been a, a significant learning for us. Uh, the impact on affordability, I think all of us struggle with that in terms of um, our ability to recruit staff, retain staff uh, at all levels uh, is a challenge for leadership and we're addressing that certainly across Stanford Medicine as well as across the entire university. Um, and also, uh, more specifically to the Children's Hospital, I've been impressed with uh, the ability for this Children's Hospital in its short life of not quite 30 years uh, to really compete at a very high level and be in comparison with organizations that we compare ourselves to who have been around for over a century. So I think uh, we're at, we've got a good start, but we've got a lot of work yet to do. So. Okay, great. Well, then, as we're entering your third trimester of go. being a leader here, <laughs> yeah. oh, okay. perfect, perfect, perfect. Yes. What are some of your goals, and how do you see some of those goals fitting in within the broader Stanford Medicine? Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, being part of uh, the longer-term planning is, is certainly what we'd want to do. Uh, as Lloyd mentioned at the top of his comments, uh, we will be having an opening of some of our facilities in our new building that opened about a year and a half ago, uh, part of the first floor and the fifth floor were not finished. And through the gracious uh, uh, generosity of some of our donors, we're able to finish off those bases and we'll be having some grand opening ceremonies as well here over the next few weeks. Uh, so going forward, uh, getting those uh, areas into full execution, that'll keep us fairly busy. Uh, we also have some, uh, on the Packard side, uh, some new members of our team. Uh, in the audience, uh, we have Rick Majan, who's our new chief operating officer, just joined us. Uh, he's quite a new fetus. He's only four weeks old. Uh, he's, uh, he joined us, uh, most, most, he did most of his work at, uh, in, in St. Louis, uh, but we're glad to have him on the team. Uh, we have a few other folks we're going to be recruiting in terms of some strategy, as well as a new chief human resources officer, so that'll keep us somewhat busy as well. Uh, Lloyd, David, and I, we have uh, occasion to meet frequently, and uh, there's no shortage of issues that we get to address, and we're going to get into some of that, I'm sure, later in this chat. Thank you. Dean Miner, we launched the Integrated Strategic Plan just over a year ago, and can you talk a little bit about some of those initiatives that have recently taken off, and what has been their impact? Sure. And by the way, Andra, thank you for joining us here at Stanford Medicine and for your great leadership. and. We're just looking so much forward to uh, the emergency department moving into its new physical facilities, facilities that will match the excellence of the faculty that you and your colleagues are building. So thank you, thank you very much. The integrated strategic plan really is an integrated plan that reaches out to and includes all of us in Stanford Medicine, and in particular, that brings together the three entities of Stanford Medicine, the School of Medicine, the adult hospital and delivery system and the children's hospital and delivery system. The purpose of the plan really was to look for, to identify the areas of synergy, the areas where we will grow and build together collaboratively and, and interactively, 
but also to recognize that each of the three entities has its own distinct areas of focus, and that will always be the case. By identifying three pillars or themes to the strategic plan, uh, namely value-focused, digitally driven, and uniquely Stanford, we're better able to identify those areas where a truly integrated strategy, where sharing resources and talents will enable each entity as an individual entity to be more successful, but very importantly, to enable the whole of Stanford Medicine to be more successful. I think we're all really excited about how well the plan has come together, uh, about the buy-in around the plan, and now, as you indicated, uh, this year is about execution and about making those three pillars of value-focused, digitally driven, and uniquely Stanford really as impactful as we know they can be. Great. So the university, the School of Medicine, and the six other schools have undergone also the long, uh, excuse me, long-range plan, so the LRP. And you just mm -hmm. discussed the Integrated Strategic Plan, the ISP. Um, have there been any friction between the two? Mm -hmm. And are there any new programs or initiatives that will specifically pertain to Stanford Medicine? Well, planning is, is always going on, and particularly at uh, complex organizations like a research university and an academic medical center. I really don't think there's been any significant friction between the long-range plan at the university level and the integrated strategic plan that we have been conducting and organizing in Stanford Medicine. We got the ISP process, the Stanford Medicine planning process, going up about a year before uh, the university's long-range plan got underway. As you know, our, our president, Mark Tessier-Levine, has been here now three years, and we really got the process for doing the long-range plan put together in the first year, and these past two years have really been about the serious planning process at the university level. Let me just say that health is a key component of the university's long-range plan. Uh, health in its broadest sense. And there will be specific elements of the university's long-range plan that have direct relevance and relationship to Stanford Medicine. In fact, I really think everything in the university's long-range plan has some sort of meaningful relationship with those of us in Stanford Medicine. I think one of the things that attracted me to come to Stanford seven years ago is that we are an academic medical center within a research university, and I've often said that our greatest strength in Stanford Medicine is the fact that we're a part of Stanford University. I believe that the integrated strategic plan and its relationship to the long-range plan of the university affirms that premise uh, that our greatest strength is the fact that we're a part of this great research university. It's going to be a really exciting decade ahead, and a decade in which all of us are going to be able to participate in building this amazing institution and extending its impact locally, regionally, and indeed globally. Great, thank you. So now we'll move off of the scripted questions and move into some provocative questions that uh, you have submitted. Uh, Paul. Why do I get the provocative? <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Go right ahead. It seems as they, though we're making great progress in more closely aligning the School of Medicine and Stanford Healthcare, but maybe not so much Packard. Is the hope to expand joint activities and initiatives between the three organizations, or will Packard always remain more of a standalone part of the triad? <laughs> um, that's a, a great question. Uh, <laughs> And actually, uh, we, we reject the premise of that question. Um, but the... Um, conceded. Conceded. Paul, we're here with you. Thank you, David. Um, uh, as I said before, David Lloyd and I, we are practically uh, back to the fetus uh, discussion. We're, we're triamese twins. Uh, but uh, we meet weekly, and we talk about a, a long range of issues. Uh, obviously, uh, the most obvious connection we have across the three of us is all of our faculty are School of Medicine faculty. So you can't be separate. Uh, if our faculty are all part of the same uh, same school. Uh, we also, um, as Lloyd mentioned before, there are some things that are uniquely children, there are some things that are uniquely adult focused, there are some things that are uniquely school focused. And what we are trying to do now is understand where those intersecting points occur 
and how we can work more uh, closely together in those areas where it makes sense for us to do so. Uh, there's a long list of areas where we already collaborate, particularly on the hospital side. Just to name a few, um, uh, design and construction, supply chain, contract administration, payer contracting, uh, compliance, laundry and linen, parking, lab, blood bank, GME. Uh, I can go on, but I think, I think you get the point that uh, we are absolutely integrated uh, within this medical center. Uh, we are absolutely committed to doing uh, more collaboration and working together going forward. And I think uh, the three of us, uh, at least since my arrival, have demonstrated that time and time again. So uh, we're very happy to be here. Thank you so much. Lloyd, how will Stanford Medicine help the faculty interact with our, within our Silicon Valley ecosystem to help drive innovations in healthcare and healthcare delivery? I think one of the really exciting aspects of being at Stanford University, Stanford Medicine, is the fact that we are a part of the Silicon Valley ecosystem. In fact, really, uh, technology, the technology firms around us in so many ways grew out of Stanford and Stanford innovations in decades past. And you know, I hope that 30 to 40 years from now, people will look at the Valley then and say that a lot of the biotech, the med tech, the innovations in digital health, a lot of those innovations have come out of Stanford and then spread into the Valley. We're already seeing a lot of interactions with the major tech firms and Stanford. We are in each other's backyard. We have a lot of expertise that brings a lot to the tech firms. And they have specific areas of expertise uh, that augments our expertise here within the university, within the School of Medicine, and the hospitals. For example, uh, one obvious example is that Apple, Google, Facebook don't deliver health care. And so if they are looking at innovations and technologies that interface with the healthcare delivery system, they're going to be partnering with institutions. And we would like them, when it's appropriate, to be partnering with us. And already we're seeing a very large number of those partnerships. But I think we've only scratched the surface. And over the next few years, we hope to deepen those collaborations and interactions. This is something that Paul, David, and I talk about and work on very regularly together. And it, it, it's an advantage of the ISP, the Integrated Strategic Plan, in that we have established one front door for the tech firms to call and interact with. Now, there will be specific opportunities in the children's hospital and the adult hospital. But rather than people in the tech firms having to keep a Rolodex with different phone numbers, we've got uh, an office that can field those inquiries and then make sure that we're reaching out and involving uh, the leaders from the institutions as appropriate. Great. David, what can be done to make doctors off-site feel more part of our medical community? I think one of the challenges, whenever you have a system that is so diverse and spread out, is inherently those who are not quote unquote, on the mothership campus, so to speak, are always going to feel a little bit disconnected. And I would say not only is it the physicians, but it's the other providers, the staff that are in these offsite locations. And so one of the things that we've tried to do is leverage technology, certainly as a mechanism. And I appreciate all that are on the line today. Uh, it's one of those opportunities that we have to connect in a real time way. At the same time, that's helpful, but we spend time actually uh, on the road, for lack of a better word, but it really is in those off-site locations to make sure that we're doing the things that we need to to be able to actually go out and be seen. Also, especially if you think about providers, the educational opportunities that not only draw people to campus, but allow uh, whether it's other providers to be able to travel off-site. There's a lot of uh, opportunities there. The other piece is making sure that the educational pieces that are diverse enough to be able to attract several different um, locations I think are helpful. But I would also say a little bit of the onus is on us as individuals too to make sure that we're making those connections. One of the best things I have found about this culture uh, is the fact that it is very collaborative. And so making sure that we take those opportunities to reach out. For example, we have a site that is in Pleasanton, California, that's actually our Valley Care site, which is a separate hospital. We actually had a strategic planning session for that group this week. 
because we want to make sure that those organizations, as Lloyd was sharing about the ISP, also are included in those planning efforts. Uh, we have a number of different things that we're doing in a network development piece, making sure that that feels connected back to campus. But I think the onus is on us to make sure that we're doing those things, whether it's through technology, whether it's uh, reaching across the aisle to our colleagues, to make sure that we put those pieces in place. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks to three of you. Uh, if we get a round of applause for our esteemed leaders here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And now we'll move on to our next session. I'd like to invite up to our stage our next panel, James Spudich, Mark Krasnow, Christine Quo, Heather Wakeley, and a moderator, Sylvia Plevredis, who will go forward with the patient story, Research Gets Personal. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. Two years ago, Dr. James Spudich, a professor here in the Department of Biochemistry, learned that he had lung cancer. And as, he's, as he was preparing for his treatment, he took the initiative to approach his colleagues and offer tissue for research. And with that was triggered a 16-hour frenzy of activity that has um, led us to one of the world's largest studies in healthy and diseased lung tissue. Jim's inspirational story really showcases the culture of collaboration, innovation, and determination that really is what is exceptional to Stanford Medicine. I'm delighted to welcome Jim to the stage with three of the many people who were responsible for his care and for the important research that ensued in studying his tissue. Please welcome uh, Mark Krasnow, also professor in the Department of Biochemistry, Kristen Koh, assistant professor in pediatrics, and Heather Wakeley, professor in oncology who specializes in lung cancer. So, Jim, it's only fitting to start with you. Um, you look terrific. Um, Tell us how you're doing. Oh, well, thanks for asking. Um, first of all, the inspirational story is the one you're going to hear from Mark, and, and not, it doesn't have to do with me. All I did was give a little sample. Um, I'm doing great. I mean, as you can see, I'm alive and well. Um, you know, my wife is from India. She points out that there are four pil pillars for healing. You all know about this. Uh, one for sure is a very supportive family. I have that in spades. Um, and another, of course, is who you have as a doctor. And I've been totally blessed to have as uh, a, pra a basic um, a family practitioner, uh, Jeffrey Croak, who's here. Um, and then, of course, uh, Joe Schrager, who's just a meticulous surgeon, removed the upper lobe of my left lung. Uh, and then, of course, Heather Wakeley is my oncologist. And you know, all three of those people um, are the best of the best in their own right. But you know, coming together and working together as a team for me has been really awesome. And so I'm in great shape and uh, really am very happy. And I should say that you know, none of them could do their jobs. And I couldn't do my job as a researcher here at Stanford, where I've been for over four decades. Uh, if it weren't for all of you. So, because place doesn't run by a few professors, right? Um, and so this is my opportunity to say thanks to everybody in the room for my health as well as for everything that you've enabled with regard to my research over all these years. So I'm great. Thanks for asking. <laughs> Happy to hear this. Um, so take us through the day that you approached your colleagues about providing that tissue sample. What were you thinking? What were you hoping? Thank you. <laughs> it all happened very fast, um, so there wasn't a lot of time to think about it. Uh, but I guess, I guess the point is, and, and many of you will understand this, uh, you know, I'm, I'm 
a scientist first and a patient second. And so I didn't approach Mark's office as a patient. Uh, we all know that uh, the kind of incredible research that he's doing and you'll hear about um, leads eventually to really outstanding advances in clinical care. But it doesn't happen quickly enough to have an impact on, on me. But I'm absolutely certain it'll have a huge impact in future uh, folks who are dealing with this. Because of the folks I mentioned, I, I consider myself cured, so don't worry about me. <laughs> um, so I didn't approach Mark as a patient. I approached him as a scientist. I think all of you would have done the same thing. Um, uh, you know, the choice was I go into surgery, um, Joe Schrager removes the upper lobe, it goes to the pathology lab, a little bit is taken for doing important studies, and then it's discarded. Now that didn't seem like a very uh, exciting opportunity <laughs> compared to See, I've been following Mark's work for several decades. And you know, it's just, as, as you all know, and if you don't, you'll hear hopefully some of it today, it, it's just remarkable what he does. So I was very familiar with his studies on development, development of adenocarcinomas in mouse and lemurs, um, but not in human tissue. And of course, human tissue is a little different from a mouse. And so I was hoping when I went into Mark's office that he might be interested in uh, having some of this tissue. And as they'll describe, actually, Kristen and, and Mark were both in the office. Guess what they were discussing? They were discussing, how could we get some human tissue? <laughs> so <laughs> unbelievably, I walk in and I say, look, uh, I'd, I'd be delighted if you would take some of my sample. You know, just need to have a couple people at the operating room uh, at the time the lung comes out, get it into dishes very quickly, get that over into cell sorters, and you're on your way. So Mark says, this is great. When is your surgery? I said, tomorrow morning at 8. <laughs> and he said, oh my god. But remarkably, they did. Uh, pull it off. And so I, I think the next question should go to these guys because it's what they've done with this that's really amazing. Thank you. Um, Mark, you and Jim are close colleagues, friends. Um, what was your immediate reaction when you heard this news? And then, then you processed this tissue. What have you learned? Well, the uh, immediate reaction was, what? <laughs> You've got lung cancer? Uh, it was, uh, Jim is uh, just a, a wonderful scientist, as I think many of you know, uh, but also just uh, uh, the best colleague and, and a great friend. And so just learning that news was uh, kind of an emotional shock. Uh, but as Jim said, when he said it's tomorrow morning at 8, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, the energy, uh, the adrenaline started running and, and, and we started moving quickly. And um, we had worked, as, as Jim alluded, we had been doing uh, this precision biology that has to come before the precision medicine. We'd been learning the kind of Steve Quake technology that pioneered in the bioengineering department of learning how genes, analyzing how genes are expressed in individual cells and all the genes that, that are expressed in individual cells. But we had been doing it on mouse, mouse lungs, mouse, mouse lemur, uh, uh, mouse uh, adenocarcinoma. So we knew that and we knew that well, but we had never worked with human tissue. It's something that Kristen, when she was a pulmonary fellow in my lab a few years ago, uh, we had discussed many, many times and had thought about. And Kristen was actually working towards that in her own lab in, in, in pediatric pulmonary. Um, but, but what we needed to do right away was to mobilize the team, the mouse team and the mouse lemur team, and, and get them ready. And they were you know, in the lab outside, and they mobilized quickly. Um, and, and, and then um, uh, the, the thing was we had to um, uh, get them to know the hospital, because most of them had never been in the clinical side of the hospital. They'd been to the cafeteria, of course, <laughs> <laughs> but never a surgical suite. <laughs> so we had to uh, uh, orient them you know, to the hospital. Uh, but then the biggest thing, the biggest challenge, because once you get down to the cell, 
cells, mouse cells and mouse lemur and human cells, you know, are all very similar. But handling the tissue and actually getting permission to, to handle the tissue, all the regulatory requirements and all the collaborations with surgeons, Joe Schrager and Heather and, and their colleagues, we had never done that. But Kristen had. Okay, wonderful. Um, Kristen, let's move to that. Um, there had to be a lot of coordination that had to come together really quickly. Could you tell us who was involved, what were some of the challenges, how you overcame those challenges to make that happen? Yeah, well, as um, Mark and Jim alluded to, a lot of people had to work together to make this happen. And um, although Mark had a great team in his own lab, um, what made it possible to actually bring all these people together on short notice was the long-term collaborations that we had developed over the course of the first year um, or two in setting up the lab. Um, I had interests in studying a specific cell type, um, which has relevance for adult cancers, actually. Um, I study one cell type, lung neuroendocrine cells, in great detail, and um, had developed these collaborations with, actually, Joe Schrager. And over the year prior, had developed um, you know, a whole team with his surgeons um, and thoracic oncology as well. And, um, and so when this all happened, and who was his surgeon? His surgeon was Dr. Schrager. So um, everything, and I sent him an email the night before explaining to him that we were going to need tissue, we were going to culture the cells, and everything was just it was in place so that we could actually activate um, you know, all the downstream. Uh, processes and teams, you know, getting the sorters ready, and we had some beads that were required to, to isolate the tissues. So, um, so it was all great. And um, so here's an example of cross-cutting uh, <laughs> uh, interactions across the pediatrics and, and medicine. That's terrific. Heather, um, take us through uh, the day for you. You worked with Dr. Schrager to provide care. Uh, what was that like for you? So most of my interactions with Jim actually came after the big fateful day of the surgery. Um, clearly, as Joe Schreger and I work very closely together, um, and across all of our thoracic group, we have a lot of, of protocols in place where when there is a patient who's willing to donate, whether it's tissue or blood, we bring in also the coordinators to make sure that those consents are signed, that everything sort of is, is done in the way that needs to be done from a regulatory perspective. And fortunately, with the collaborations that had already been in place, that part was, was there. Um, and then my place came in a little bit later. Um, I am not a laboratory scientist. I'm more of a clinical investigator. Um, and so most of my interactions with, with Jim had come after he had recovered from his surgery. We had met before the surgery, of course, and, and talked, and he had expressed his interest in, in donating so much of, of the, the tissue that came out to be able to really answer some key scientific questions. So. Well, thank you. Mark, I'd like to come back and ask you now, tell us about what you might have learned to date analyzing this tissue. Yeah, you know, it... Um, like a good scientist, uh, you know, we didn't go right to the, the tumor tissue because what's limiting about understanding the tumor tissue is understanding the normal tissue, you know, and how it's been changed by the transformative mutations that lead to the, initiate the cancer. And so we have spent most of the last two years working on the surrounding healthy tissue from Jim Jim's lung. And what we discovered was that, uh, as many of you know, that there, there are something like 44 or 45 uh, cell types in a normal human lung. And in doing the single cell expression profile, we, we discovered that uh, those cells, of course, but we discovered 14 new cell types in the, in the human lung from this. And, and, and actually, we've just gotten back now over the last couple of months to starting to understand the tumor tissue and basically understanding how those normal cells are transformed by the mutations and how the infiltrating tissues, uh, cell types come in and are changed uh, by, in the tumor microenvironment. And that is uh, uh, providing all, all kinds of new insights into uh, the mechanism of tumor initiation, infiltration, and, and how the immune cells, for example, are, are being attracted to and, and, and fighting the tumor, which should help in the development, for, of course, for immunotherapies and other no novel therapies in the years ahead. That's really exciting and exciting to hear that. Um, Joe, I want to be uh, mindful of the time, and I'm supposed to have a countdown timer, but I don't see it working. Are we good on time? Ten more minutes? Sorry? Ten minutes. Okay, terrific. We have, we have a lot of material to cover. <laughs> okay. 
Yes. So, so let me come back to the clinical part. Um, uh, so, so Heather, um, you have a trial of your own that I think Jim participated in. Could you describe the trial and tell us how it's progressing? Certainly, and I, I want to highlight, so uh, Jim's gave us generously of his tissue right at the beginning, but then he's been continuing to provide blood samples over time as part of research that's being done by Max Dean and Ash Elizade looking for circulating tumor DNA, and so that's an ongoing contribution. Um, and he was also willing to be part of a clinical trial involving novel treatment for patients who have had hopefully a curative surgery, um, but to reduce the risks of the cancer coming back. So going back in time to when I first started on as faculty um, over 15 years ago, we were just learning that if we gave chemotherapy after someone had had a surgery, that we could actually improve cure rates. Um, and so though he wasn't obviously very excited about this idea, Jim uh, did um, go ahead and receive chemotherapy to reduce the chance of his cancer recurring. And then we've been trying to move forward beyond that and uh, a couple of interesting aspects of, of Jim's tumor did realize that he had a specific driver mutation in his tumor uh, known as BRAF. There are other patients with other driver mutations in tumors um, some of the ones we think about the most in lung cancer are EGFR and ALK. And when we identified those tumor mutations in patients who have had their tumor removed, we have clinical trials that are ongoing where we offer people those, the, the medications that have been developed to specifically target those mutations. We don't know that that actually changes cure rates yet, and so those are still clinical trials. And so if Jim had had EGFR, we would have been able to talk about a clinical trial giving an EGFR oral medication or not. Um, in the BRAF setting, we, we didn't have that as a trial option, but we did talk about that and what that would mean if we ever did see his tumor again, which I do not think we will, but just as an okay. Um, the, where we are doing clinical trial work, though, is with the, the new, um, what we call, well, they're not that new, about five years ago now, we really revolutionized cancer treatment with the immune therapies, with the checkpoint inhibitors especially the PD-1 and PD-L1 checkpoint inhibitors, of which we have multiple now on the market for patients who have metastatic lung cancer. And so when I have a patient who presents to see me now with metastatic disease, very often we will be offering one of these immune checkpoint inhibitors. If they have one of the targeted agents, sometimes we'll go on that path, but if they don't, we're talking about these immune um, agents, which can really improve survival rates. Um, but we don't yet know if they change cure rates for patients who have earlier stages of disease. And so there are multiple ongoing trials looking at either giving the drugs before surgery or after surgery. And so at the time of uh, gym surgery and after recovered, we talked about proceeding with the study, which involved going ahead and giving what we know to be standard of care chemotherapy. And then there's a randomization after the chemotherapy is concluded where patients either get an up to a year of immune therapy or not. Um, and so uh, Jim was uh, very open to participating in the trial, and um, that's obviously a, a big deal as a patient when you're faced with having gone through a big surgery and then having to go through chemotherapy. And then this question of, am I going to be willing to be randomized, right? That's a, a very big question, especially as a, as a scientist. Obviously, I didn't have to explain the pros and cons of that so much. Um, and this idea that we think it might be helpful, but we don't know if it's helpful. And therefore, we can't just give the agent because we don't know. We have to have some people who get it and some people who don't. And I don't get to pick who's who. Um, it's this randomization idea. And Again, as a scientist, Jim was very open to participating, and, and that was wonderful. And that then brought in our, our team of uh, research coordinators. So there's a, a huge group of people very involved in the clinical research aspect of things at Stanford as well. And so mobilized there. Jim participated, was able to get through the chemotherapy pretty well, actually. Um, and then the moment of randomization came and ended up, um, Jim is on the observation arm, but he took that happily, and uh, we're continuing to follow closely, and actually had a, a very nice follow-up yesterday with everything going well, so. <laughs> Wonderful. Kristen, tell us a little bit more about what you are hoping to understand through this research. Sure, so um, as Mark pointed out, there are over 50 cell types in the lung that we now know of, and um, I've, in 
studying pediatric diseases, I've always thought that it's so important to know about all the different cell types. So all the cell types are important to know about. So I was completely enthusiastic about that aspect of the project. But then, um, beyond that, uh, it was a total bonus for me that we actually got the first 50 human neuroendocrine cells profiled by single cell analysis from his lungs. And I'd been studying these cells in mouse lung. And they're really, really rare. Um, a lot of people don't even know about them. They're, these, um, they're like less than 1% of the airway epithelial cells, but they can sense. Um, now we know they sense a variety of stimuli, and they also secrete um, tons of peptides, new, new neuropeptides, neurohormones. And Jim's neuroendocrine cells secrete even more, or are predicted to secrete even more than the, the <laughs> mouse. <laughs> so we don't know if that's Jim specific yet, but, um, <laughs> but uh, we hope that in the coming year that we'll get more, um, more samples and more patients. So this is just the start. We're really excited. Yeah, so from, from, from just that one cell type that Kristen's been focusing on, the neuroendocrine cells, we now know that there's a new endocrinology uh, of the lung that sends signals, that senses what's going on in the airways, and then sends signals to lots of cells, uh, other cell types in the lung, but also uh, uh, not other cells not in the lung, and, and, and probably communicates with other parts of the body and the brain with now dozens of neuropeptides and hormones that are being produced by these very rare cells uh, in yeah, the lung. The, the reason I came to the cell type in the beginning was because of a pediatric patient I took care of um, in fellowship with a disease called neuroendocrine cell hyperplasia of infancy. But as we've learned, these cells also give rise to really aggressive tumors, and they're stem cells for small cell lung cancer, really metastatic tumor, um, as well as a variety of um, tumors that are more low-grade neuroendocrine tumors, like carcinoids, um, as well as the uh, uh, diffuse idiopathic neuroendocrine cell hyperplasia. So there's a spectrum of um, tumors on the adult side that are or express neuroendocrine markers. So it's very important to know the diversity of the cells, um, what they're producing. And you know, these could develop and um, become the markers that we find could help in prognosis and developing new therapies potentially. So this is why, this is what I was hoping to learn um, from my research eventually and in the broader scope of things to support the research that happens here at Stanford and then you know, learning the specific cell types, but it was a total bonus for me <laughs> to have the neuroendocrine cells. Oh, that's very, very exciting. So Jim, you've been a professor at Stanford for 42 years. You've got your PhD at Stanford. Um, what does it mean to you as a patient, as a scientist, to see your colleagues collaborate so efficiently and effectively and learn so much from your own personal experience? Hmm. Well. You know, I think it's uh, well known to this audience that Stanford's a really incredibly unusual place. Um, you know, the four or more decades I've been working here, um, I've seen so many incredible innovations and developments um, that really are, are, are used worldwide and, and they tend to come largely from Stanford University, quite honestly. So it's not a new thing that, that um, Stanford has been great at innovation and, and, uh, and, and coming up with technologies that just change uh, issues dramatically. I think what's, having been here so long, what I've watched happen, which I'm so excited about, is that in the last decade, I would say, uh, there's almost nothing you can do in the basic science lab. And I'm sort of a hardcore biophysicist almost uh, doing, you know, single molecule laser trap work. And you wouldn't think that that would necessarily uh, translate into medicine, but it, it does. And in fact, there are things in clinical trials from a company I started that, that really came from those very basic studies. And that's what's happening just over and over again. So I think there's, there's none of us in basic science that do anything which these days, which wasn't true 20, 30 years ago, uh, that immediately relates to the clinical sciences and, and clinical medicine. So that's a really exciting time. And you're all here you know, in a very, very amazing time of history. Stanford's a great place. I think that's why. None of us who've all, I'm sure, been recruited by other places for many years have never left. That's 
that's a great note to end on. <laughs> I'd like to thank our panelists for sharing this remarkable story. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> okay. okay, great. Now I'd like to invite to the stage Dr. Carla Puth, Professor of Surgery. She'll be leading us through an interactive session, so please take out your mobile devices and navigate to the URL on the screen. Thank you so much, Sylvia. I enjoyed this panel, it was amazing. So I will invite everyone to pull out your cell phones. We are going to engage in a poll. We're titling this, Who Knows Stanford Medicine? Uh, I promise you, if you get the wrong answer, uh, we won't uh, put it on your permanent record. Uh, I, I promise. So uh, please go ahead and navigate if you just type in pollev.com. Uh, SOSM 2019, and I'm going to do it on my phone as well. I have it queued up, and I realize they ask you to uh, accept cookies. Too bad they're not real ones. Is everyone ready? All right, so a gut guess is fine. We're going to move really quickly, and uh, when prompted, just enter your response, and then we'll see the uh, results on the screen. Can we go ahead and get ready for the first question? So our existing emergency department was designed to treat 35,000 patients per year. Uh, but currently, we actually treat 70,000. And so the increased capacity of 500P will enable us to care for how many? Right. Is there a timer on the, has everyone entered their answer? So there you go, the answer. So most people answered 85,000 and I know the reason why. So that actually is the exact estimate that we will um, treat by the end of this year, but our capacity is 100,000. All right, so we'll move on to the next question. So this year's, uh, are we voting already? That's awesome, I love you guys, this is fantastic. Um, I'll just keep reading and sort of be formal for those who are, aren't, aren't participating. This year's incoming uh, School of Medicine class has one of the most diverse uh, in history. And so what percentage identify as a group that is underrepresented in medicine? All right, so 37% said 25% and that is absolutely correct. So what we do know uh, is that uh, diversity and, and inclusion is a core value uh, here at Stanford Medicine. And we've definitely seen that diversity and background as well as perspective has um, really helped us to make major strides in our core missions of research, uh, healthcare, and um, education. And what's been interesting is that one example from the patient care side is that uh, what we know on a national level is that uh, patients who are underserved many times uh, have a lack of trust in the healthcare system from historical reasons. And there are a number of uh, research papers that have been written about that. What's really exciting for us is that one of our own, uh, Dr. Marcella Alsan, uh, has conducted a study that showed that African American men who are treated by African American physicians who are male uh, in gender um, are more likely to uh, receive uh, the information that the physicians are providing them. They're more likely to engage in screening uh, behavior and follow up for their care. And so I think that that's uh, something that if we can reproduce across all of the underserved groups and anyone who has a lack of trust in the healthcare system, that will obviously improve our overall um, uh, outcomes in terms of the health care that we provide. So this is really amazing, and I'd love to congratulate Dr. Alsan on her research. Uh, so we'll now move on to the third question. So Lucier Packard's Children's Hospital uh, at Stanford is the only level one pediatric trauma center in the Bay Area. So how many patients are transported by air ambulance to LBCH each year? What's your guess? Come
correct. So uh, the correct answer is 200, which is really amazing. And this is, again, just by air transport. Um, what we, what we really know is that over half a million patients um, are treated uh, here and on an outpatient basis. Uh, what's another interesting uh, point is that the Johnson Center for Pregnancy and Newborn Services is proud to welcome over 4,000 babies into the world each year, which is amazing. Um, Lucille Packard Children's Hospital is a national leader uh, in pediatric cardiology and solid organ transplants such as liver, heart, uh, kidney, and lung. And uh, we perform over 900 st stem cell transplants each year, and the expertise uh, is across more than 70 different uh, diseases. And we have some of the most complex cases that we uh, take in at the Children's Hospital every year. Other interesting tidbits is that, um, I don't see there's more about the Packard Hospital in terms of uh, the variety of diseases that we treat. Uh, and the healthcare providers were number one uh, in some of the uh, cancer and congenital diseases and some of the more complex uh, patients come our way every year. So it's really exciting uh, to be at the forefront of healthcare for um, our pediatric and neonate patients. Thank you. We have another question. So Stanford Medicine has received the most NIH funding per uh, investigator since 2013. So how much NIH funding did Stanford Medicine receive in fiscal year 2018? So yes. We got the big number <laughs> this year, and that makes everyone smile. It's very, very exciting. Um, so the other numbers actually represent uh, the amount of funding that we've had in prior years. Uh, A and B represent our funding in 2014 and 2013, um, and that is a span of over six years. Stanford Medicine has received more um, and more NIH funding, which speaks to the quantity and the quality and of the innovative and impactful research that's occurring here. So I hope you had a good time playing our game. Uh, I enjoyed being your host, and now I would like to invite uh, Dean Miner to the stage for some final comments. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. Well, we're almost done, but we have a special treat for you. If you look underneath your seats, uh, there are three seats here in Berg Hall and two at Redwood City that have some special things available. <laughs> Tickets to the Stanford, Arizona football game. Uh, if you see an empty seat next to you, feel free to check underneath <laughs> it as well. We want to give them all away. But thank you all very much for being here, for sharing this afternoon with us, and we look forward to staying in touch. Have a good day. <laughs>